right, uh, let's see here. I think I'll read you a few verses, but you can go ahead and be finding Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Like I said, I'll read you a few verses in our introduction, but most of them uh, are familiar that you've probably heard. And uh, we'll lay the groundwork with those and then get to uh, Numbers there. And uh, we'll actually go to two more places uh, each point tonight, we have three points. Each point of them have a different place in the Bible that I want you to see. So obviously on Wednesday night, we try to do more of a uh, Bible study. So we kind of, that's why we're going to jump around and look at some verses and things like that. And uh, again, most of this uh, we've all heard uh, and we would, we would agree with, things like that. But maybe the Lord will show us something tonight that maybe we hadn't thought of uh, and, and it'll help us. Uh, in our in our lives and our endeavors, uh, I've seen uh, my wife. She, if she was not a musician and a servant of the Lord, she's always said that she would like to be a lawyer, and uh, and so she's uh, you know uber smart. Uh, you know she she's you know very uh, you know intelligent things like that, and and made great grades and. Uh, me being the opposite of that, all right, and so uh, she could have done it, I know she could, and, uh, and, and so forth, things like that, uh, but so she's watched a lot of uh, true uh, cases, you know, where they show them on TV, uh, you know, there's different ones, things like that, she's watched that, and uh, uh, she likes to, you know, uh, watch those type of shows and things like that, but I've heard this said many times on, on cop shows or police shows or where, they, where they've shown this, uh, where you know somebody comes up to you and you know maybe holds you at gunpoint and says, "Give me your money." Uh, you know they they teach you this. They tell you you know don't don't resist things like that. And, and you know if there's ever a group of people and they're 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 holding the one person at gunpoint and they says, "You know give me all your money." Usually, what the people that doesn't have the gun put at their stomach or their head or whatever is like, "Do what they say." Now, do what they say. All right. And uh, now there's different. Uh, things that I've ta been taught, you know, of course, if you've ever been uh, trained with a weapon, uh, you can keep yourself safe. If you've been trained maybe hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, they tell you, you know, don't ever get in the car with anybody and this, that, and other, you know, fight right there, things like that. But I have heard this say, said over and over, if somebody's holding a gun point, they say, give me your money. There's no amount of money worth your life, okay? So just give it to them. Do what they say. Uh, and so that's the title of my sermon tonight, Do What They Say. Uh, and we're going to see some places in the Bible uh, where certain people say, this is what I want you to do. And according to God's word, we're supposed to do what they say. Uh, now that goes against all of our nature. Why? Because we have a sinful nature. We don't like to be told what to do. Uh, and I remember from as long as I can remember. You know, I'm sure there were some things that I can't remember, uh, and I was probably a precious little baby, <laughs> all right? But once I started having my own opinions and things like that, I didn't like to be told what to do. Uh, and I've told you before, my mom would say I would, you know, if I was told to do something, I would wind up with my arms. I mean, I was, gonna, I was showing my dislike and my displeasure, and I would, <clears throat> and then usually that lip would come out, and maybe I would stomp across the floor. Why? Because that's just how we are born. We're born where we resist it. Uh, we don't like to be told what to do. Uh, again, a police officer pulls us over. We don't like to go the speed limit. We want to go faster, things like that. So it's just in our nature. And so it starts right here. And again, uh, those of you that are parents, you know, I'm sure you've taught this verse as a memory verse to your children. Uh, but Ephesians 6, 1 says this, children, obey your parents. And here's the key word, key words, in the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In other words, the Bible is saying here is, uh, you know, for instance, if your parents, you know, they weren't saved and they weren't in the Lord, uh, you know, and they said, I want you to shoot this person or I want you to rob this bank or I want you to, you would be, you know, freed from that instruction. Right? Why? Because that's not in the Lord. That they're telling you to do something right, uh, wrong. Uh, and so that's why it's saying here, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And anybody on the backside of that wall right there has, has battled that. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, they, they don't, 
they, they're, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, get, I'm big enough, you know, I don't want to do what I'm out. And we, but do what they say. That's what God would say to those children back there. If your parents tell you to do something in the Lord, do it. Do what they say. Uh, Colossians 3.20, if you want another verse. Children, obey your parents. And it, goes, and it goes on to say, in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So, again, a child is supposed to obey his mom and dad. Uh, whether they agree with it or not. Whether they want to do it or not. Uh, if it's in the Lord and it's, it's not against the Bible, they're supposed to obey in all things. Go take a bath. Well, I won't take a bath. They're supposed to go take a bath. Eat your vegetables. Well, I don't like broccoli. All right. We've all been there. We've been on both sides of that. Okay. Uh, and so we see, do what they say. All right. Here's another one. Let's, uh, you don't have to go there. I'll just read them to you. So that was talking to children. These two verses are talking to Christians. So that's all of us. <laughs> Church members, that's all of us, all right? And here it is. Just like those kids back there are supposed to obey their parents. I'm just reading us the Bible, all right? Now, this one's going to talk about me a little bit. And just like I've been a parent, still am a parent, but uh, praise the Lord, they're raised, all right? Uh, again, I didn't want them to obey me because I was a super dad or an awesome dad or a perfect dad. I wanted them to obey me because the Bible said so. So these next verses, it's talking about this same person that has been a dad that wasn't a perfect dad, that wasn't super dad, that didn't have it all together, but asked God to help him as a pastor. I'm not super pastor. I don't have superpowers. I can't smack you in the head and make you do, say, feel anything. All right? But I can preach the word of God. That's what we're supposed to listen to. Hebrews 13, 7 says this, Remember them which have the rule over you, who has spoken unto you the word of God. So that's any Sunday school teacher that's ever taught you the word of God, a parent that's taught you maybe family devotions, anybody that's ever spoke to you the word of God, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So again, just like a parent if they're teaching their children not to lie and to obey and to do their best and to you know, live godly, that's in the Lord. The child's supposed to do that. Why? Because that's what the Bible says to do. Not because they're received or you know, arrived at super parenthood. Same thing here. Any pastor in the world, if they're preaching God's word, we're supposed to listen to them. Again, not because they're super pastor or they've achieved some superpowers, but because they're preaching. It says right there, who has spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follower. Consider the end of their conversation. So we're, we're supposed to listen to our parents if they're teaching us the word of God. Listen to our Sunday school teachers. Listen to our youth director or a children's director or an evangelist or a guest speaker or our pastor. Not, again, because of who they are, but because of what they're saying. And that's the word of God. Skip down a couple verses in that one. Hebrews 13, 17 says this. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not grief for it is unprofitable to you. So according to this verse, I'm supposed to preach the word of God. And as a church, we're supposed to listen to what I'm saying again. Not because of what I'm saying, but because of the word of God. And then it says here that I'm going to give an account. Uh, and so if God tells me uh, through the Holy Spirit or through my Bible study, this is what I want you to preach. And I was like, mm, they're not going to like that. Uh, you know, so I'm not going to speak on that, Lord. I'm going to give an account for that uh, because I was supposed to come say that uh, and, and so forth. So we see here, uh, children, obey your parents. Christians, obey those that preach the word of God to you. And here's the third one. This is talking about the child of God. Uh, Hebrew, I'm sorry. Ephesians 4.30 says this, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So parents teach those kids, and the kids don't like it, but they're supposed to do what they say. Sometimes the preacher preaches the Word of God, and Christians don't like what they're saying, but what are they supposed to do? Do what they say. Do what the Word of God is. The Holy Spirit sometimes comes to us and says, I want you to change this, or fix this, or behave this way. Uh-uh. We're grieving the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to do what He says. So we see here in the introduction, there's three things here. And I've seen kids not like it. I've seen Christians not like it. I've seen children of God not like it. But we're, the best thing that we can do 
is to do what they say. Why? Because then it goes on to say here, it is unprofitable for you. <laughs> that kid that told their mom, no, I'm not going to. And maybe even added a adder. That probably wasn't very profitable to that young man. And the reason I said young man is because I've done that before, okay? Uh, <laughs> no, mom. Oh, it was not very profitable. It felt good at the time. I mean, I got a little, you know, gave her a little piece of my mind. I only had a little piece at that time probably. Uh, but I gave it to her. And I mean, I felt, it felt good, but it was unprofitable that evening when my dad got home from work. And she said, your son, because anytime I did something stupid, I was his son, okay? Your son told me no and stuck his tongue out at me. Oh, my goodness. It was very unprofitable that evening. Uh, it was hard to sit down. Uh, because it was, you know, we see here. So same thing, but I've also been a Christian and heard my preacher preach and the Word of God be preached and like, mm, I don't know if I want to line up with that or not. I, that goes against my grain a little bit. And it'd be unprofitable to me. Uh, then to tell the Holy Spirit, it's unprofitable. So just do what they say. So, uh, by the way, of introduction, number one, listen, obey, and follow. Because it will be profitable or unprofitable to us. Now we're in Numbers chapter 21. And then we're going to look at three places in the Bible where what was being said sounded foolish. <laughs> Didn't make sense at all. It's kind of like when your parents said, hey, go do your homework. I don't like homework. I would rather play with my Hot Wheels. I would rather play with my Barbies. I would rather watch TV. I would rather take a nap. All right. But it was told, go do your homework. Why? Because they didn't want you to go through life being a melon head and not know things and not be able to make it life. So it doesn't make sense to do your homework because it sounds way more fun to do anything else other than that. So a lot of times in the Bible, or these three times in the Bible, we're going to see where it just did not make sense. But what they should have done was do what they said. Do what they said. We're going to look at Numbers chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. And it says here, And when King Arid, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell of Israel, came by the way of the spies. So we know this story. You know, ten were good, or I guess uh, you know, t twelve, uh, ten went out, two were good, two and eight were bad, uh, and so forth. And so they, they went through all that, and they conquered, and, and so forth. So this has been a little while now. So he had heard tell that Israel had God on their side. And it says here, And he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoner. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou will indeed deliver this people unto my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. So, of course, we see here God's people had been attacked and some of them had been taken captivi in captivity. Uh, and so they did the right thing. They started praying, saying, Lord... <laughs> Uh, if you'll help us here, we'll just go out and take, the, take care of these people. And it says here, And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered uh, up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And they uh, called uh, the name of the, the place Hormuth. Uh, and it says here, And they journeyed, journeyed from Mount Hor uh, by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And it says here, And their souls of the people was much discouraged because of the way. So again, we see here that they were just living their life. Some of their people got taken into captivity. They said, Lord, help us. We need your help. And he did, and he, they were able to destroy it. Everything was going good. It's kind of like when we have a, you know, a spiritual victory in our life, and, and the Lord's right there, and we're whistling while we're worked. We're humming a hymn, and everything's just going great. Then all of a sudden, you know, the hot water heater goes out, the car breaks down, the kids are just being just, uh, and it just all the way. The way messes with us sometimes. It gets in the way of our good spirit. It gets in the way of our living like a Christian and acting like a Christian. And lo and behold, but we're supposed to be able to handle that. But it says here that they got discouraged by the way. And usually what happens when we get discouraged, <laughs> it says here, and the people spake against God and against Moses. So now they're, they're, they're discouraged a little bit because of some things that's going on in the way. So then they start blaming God. And then they start blaming the preacher. Uh, and then it says, Wherefore you have brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. And we're going to see not only do when people get discouraged that they get mad at God and start blaming God 
God shouldn't have let this happen. I don't, I don't understand. Or that preacher said. But then they also exaggerate. All right, let's see what they say here. <laughs> you brought us out here out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. I don't think he brought them out there to let them die. Then they go on and says here, for there is no bread, nothing to eat. And I mean, right here in their same sentence, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. I thought you said there was no bread. <laughs> so again, we always, when we get discouraged in the way, we blame God, we blame the preacher, and we exaggerate. You know, nothing ever goes right. I don't like the word nothing or never or always, because usually it's, you know, it's exaggerating. You know, if you know, your husband and wife are, you know, you never. Well, I don't know about never now. Give me some credit. <laughs> I've done some things right. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I bought you some flowers 15 years ago. Don't say never, okay? Uh, so we just, you know, throw us under the bus. And again, I'm doing that because my wife's on that side of the wall. But anyway, uh, you know, so we see here, we, we exaggerate. And they're exaggerating. We hate this white, this light bread. And so the Lord gets upset because of their mouthing him, mouthing the preacher, exaggerating, being discouraged. It's here, and the Lord sent fiery serpents. So talk about unprofitable again. <laughs> you know, if we don't obey and do what they say, it's always unprofitable. So it says here, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the, the people. And much people of Israel died. And of course, uh, I hate snakes. Poisonous or not. Uh, you know, that's what they always say. Oh, don't kill the unpoisonous ones. They keep the poisonous away. Well, if I just kill them all, they're all the way. Okay. It's just done. Okay. Uh, and so anyway, I, I don't like them. So uh, they, they got bit and they died, some of them and so forth. And so it was unprofitable, but it kind of got their attention. It says here, and therefore the people came to Moses and said, preacher, <laughs> we've sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. <laughs> Pray unto the Lord that he take away these serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it came to pass that when everyone that is bitten, when, they, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and he put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent the brass uh, of brass, he lived. All right, so again, we see here first place in the Bible where doesn't make scientifically, it doesn't make sense scientifically, <laughs> uh, it doesn't make you know, sense emotionally, uh, you know, educationally, it just doesn't make sense. But that's what God said to do. And so again, now they have a decision to make. Do they do what they say? Do what God said? Do what the preacher says? Do what the Bible says? Or do they just say, forget it, it doesn't make sense to me. So we see some uh, at that time uh, with whole heart said, I mean, this snake poison is killing me. If that, you know, and they'd gotten right and they'd ask the, you know, God to forgive them, ask the preacher to forgive them and said, you know, please pray for the Lord to do this. And so as soon as they heard, you know, I've, I've not done what he said uh, and I've gotten a, a, a predicament here. It's unprofitable to me. I'm repenting, and I want to do it. So they looked at that snake, I mean, as fast as they could. And they got healed. That's what the Bible says. Uh, well, it just doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's what God said. Then there were some that kind of like half-heartedly said, well, what can it hurt? <laughs> uh, you know, and there's Christians like that. There's Christians that wholeheartedly believe that book. Whatever that book says, that's what they're going to do. And bless God, and that's the way it is. Then there's some, they kind of listen. Mm, well, let's try. <laughs> right? But God's promise is God's promise. But then there were some that said, that's about the dumbest thing that I've ever heard in my life. Here we are with snake bites on us and we're dying and some have already died. And Moses, you're saying, look at a brass serpent. What's that going to do? And they, they just like, that's the dumbest thing. Then there were some that were a bit rebellious. I don't want to look, and ain't nobody going to make me look. Kind of like, I don't want to. You're not going to make me. And guess what happened to them? They died. It's my life. You know, some of the kids used to say, YOLO, you only live once. My life, man. They're going to die. 
I'm not going to, and it, just because it doesn't make sense. It's my body, my life, my decision. The kind of things that you hear in the news these days. It doesn't make sense. Do what they say. God said he made man and woman. <laughs> so, scientifically, you know, we know that brass has no medical you know, substance in it that will heal a snake bite. I'm not looking. <laughs> it says here, you know, who, who says looking at a brass? And just looking at something, that can't, that can't heal me. So we see here that it was silly sounding to some, but they should have just done what he said. And let's, I'm going to read you a verse. John 3, 14 says this, And Moses lifted up a servant in the wilderness. The rest of the verse says this, Even so, the Son of Man shall be lifted up. So in the New Testament, it likens to a story of the Old Testament that God put in there. And we can look at the same scenario here. Some people says, all I got to do is believe Jesus was God's son. Ask him to come into my heart and save me and I'll go to heaven when I die. Mm -hmm, that's all you got to do. That's about dumb. So faith, we are looking toward or looking back to what Jesus did on the cross. We admit we're a sinner. We believe that he was God's son. We believe that he died and rose again. And we call upon him and ask him to save us. And he'll save us and take us to heaven. Just like they, if they would have looked at that brass serpent that day, they would have lived. Doesn't make sense. Do what they say. Now let's go to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. So just a few more books over towards the New Testament. 2 Kings. We're going to see another story that we've probably heard. But it just doesn't make sense. And we'll see the guy even says that it doesn't make sense. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. Verses 1 through 15. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Verse 1 says this Now, Naaman, the captain of the hosts of the kings of Syria, or the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord hath given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of, in valor, but he was a leper. So here we are, we have a guy that's in charge of a lot of the armies for the king. He's a captain. Uh, he's a man of valor. He can fight. He's got all kinds of battling uh, wisdom uh, and so forth, leadership skills, things like that. But he's dying of leprosy. So then it goes on to say, and, and the Syrians uh, had gone out of the, by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. So again, this is a time where the Lord was allowing his children to be taken into captivity again. <laughs> you know, if you read through the whole Old Testament, captive, free, captive, free. You'd think they would have got the hint <laughs> uh, and just lived like God wanted them to instead of going back into captivity. Anyway, we see here that they had taken this little, the little girl and brought her into Naaman's home. And he was take, she was you know, basically like a little maid to the wife. And it says here, and she said to her mistress, would God, my Lord... Where the, with the prophet uh, that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, first time I ever read that verse, it just like slapped me upside the head. <laughs> One, she's taken captive. I thought she might have been a little upset. You know, I'm having to be a maid to this woman and that guy. They took me away from my family. <laughs> uh, but here she is. Concerned about their, where, their where, welfare. Uh, and so, wow. <laughs> you know, what a Christian. Things weren't going her right, way, but she was still trying to be what God wanted her to be. And be how God wanted her to be. So obviously we can learn from that. But then she says here, I wish you know, Naaman could go over here to the, my preacher. Because <laughs> my preacher would take care of that leprosy. It says here, and one went in and told the Lord, saying, thus and thus said the maid... Uh, that is of the land of Israel. This is what the little girl was telling your wife. This is what you need to do. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed, and, and he told him, Go on, I'm going to send a letter to the king uh, of Israel and, and say, I need to come and get this leprosy taken care of. So he took uh, with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Uh, sounds like me going on a trip. Uh, my wife says I pack way more than she does. Uh, but anyway, you never know what you're going to do. 
Uh, you go to my dad's house, you might have to help him work, so you need some work clothes. Uh, you might have to go to church, so you need some church clothes. Uh, you might go fishing, so you need some fishing clothes. Uh, you might go play basketball with your nephew, so you need some ba- So I got to have all So anyway, I get it. Anyway, so it says here he, he took ten changes of raiment. And it says here he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, uh, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, uh, my servant, to thee, and that thou mayest recover him from leprosy. And so the king gets this letter. And it says, and it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he ran his clothes. Like, what can I do? <laughs> I, I can't heal anybody of leprosy. And uh, he was upset, ripped his clothes. Must have been related to Hulk Hogan. Uh, and so ripped his shirt off. But anyway, uh, it says here, and said, uh, am I God uh, to kill and to make alive? Uh, this man doth send unto me to recover a man of leprosy. Wherefore, consider, I pray you, uh, and see... Uh, how he should quarrel against me. And so then it says here, when Elisha, the man of God, the preacher, had heard that the king had got this letter. So he went in Israel, and it says here, and he heard that the king had rent his clothes, and so he sent unto the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Don't, don't panic. <laughs> don't freak out here. Uh, let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So tell them they can send the guy over here, and they'll know that there's a preacher here. And so Naaman came, with his horses and with his chariots, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. So he came to the preacher's house. And it says here, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying. And so again, this kind of ticks off the, the captain. <laughs> you know, here I am coming over here to get healed and take care of this leprosy. And the preacher won't even come out here. He sends somebody else. <laughs> but the person sent said this, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall, shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So he tells him what to do, but it didn't make sense. Just like, go look at the serpent, and you'll not die of the snake bite. That doesn't make sense. Go dip seven times in the the Jordan, and you'll be clean. That doesn't make sense. (laughs) So verse 11 says, But Naaman was wroth, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me. Here I am, a captain, drove, you know, drove, (laughs) rode uh, my chariot all the way to his house, and it says here, and he stand and call my name on the Lord, his God. And he striked his hands over the place and recovered the leper. So he thought that Elisha would come out there and do some type of, you know, hoodoo, voodoo stuff on him and slap his hands together, make him smack him upside the head like these so-called TV evangelists. You know, if they got the power, I think they just ought to go down to the children's hospital and just spend all day is what I'm thinking. But anyway, uh, but, you know, he, th- he thought that's what would happen. You know, here I am, you know, some big production would come out and he'd smack him upside the head, things like this, and he'd, he would heal him. But it says here, uh, you know, Abana and Prophar, the rivers over Damascus are better than the waters here in Israel. And so not, what he said next was, the rivers over where I live is way cleaner than they are if these ones over here, the Jordan. Uh, and so why, why wouldn't I go over there and wash them and be clean? So he turned around around away and he went away in a rage he was stomping he had his lip poked out he was mad that makes no sense and so his servant came up to him and said in verse 13 uh, and came near and spake unto him and said my father if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing so what if he said uh, you know do a million setups you know who could do a million setups but you'd have tried uh, if he'd have said you know eat you know, a 12 foot long sub sandwich instead of a foot long, eat 12 of them. You know, who can do that? Uh, you know, if he'd have told you to do some great feat, would you have done that? It says here, wouldst thou not have done it? How much better then than when he had said it to thee, wash and be clean? It's that simple. Go get in the river, hold your nose if you need to, <laughs> all right, and just go up and down seven times. How easy is that? It says here, and then he went and dipped himself in seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And this flesh came, or his flesh came again like the flesh when he was a little child, and he was clean. And it says here, and he returned to the man of God and all the company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, Take this blessing to the servant. Of course, it goes on to say that you know, Elisha didn't take it. So no, that's fine. Uh, God did it. Didn't want any of the credit. So we see here, here's the second place in the Bible that it made no sense. 
uh, to do what the preacher had said done. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't even understand. Uh, I got cleaner rivers over at my place uh, and so forth. So just like we've heard, ask Jesus to save you and come into your heart. That doesn't make sense. I'm supposed to surrender my life to him instead of do my own thing. That doesn't make sense. Do God's will, not your own will. That doesn't make sense. Keep yourself pure. Marry who God created for you to marry. Spend your life serving him and he'll bless you. That doesn't make sense. But that's what the, that's what the Bible tells us to do and God will bless us. And the third and final one we'll look at, uh, well, I guess these, these three things after that. Uh, you know, basically he came back and stood before the preacher and said, thank you and, and all this stuff. So if we'll do what the Bible says, one day we'll stand before God and hear, hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, we'll stand before God one day and we'll, we'll receive rewards, rewards. And we'll stand before God one day and we'll be able to cast our crowns at his feet if we'll do what he says. Number three, let's go to Matthew. Last one. Got a few minutes left. So Matthew 19. Let's go to Matthew 19. Uh, again, look at that serpent and live. Doesn't make sense. It's profitable if you'll just do what the Bible says. Go dip seven times. That doesn't make sense. It's profitable unto you to do what the Bible says. So again, when we read it for ourselves, or we hear it taught or we hear it preached, and if it goes against our grain, it's probably going against our, our old nature, <laughs> uh, not our new nature. Our new nature would say, this is the way, walk ye in it. So again, we have to obey what the Bible says. Number three, we see here, Matthew 19, let's look at verse 16. Matthew 19, verse 16, it says here, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter unto life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which, Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said, all these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And verse 22 says here, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So we see here what he should have done was done what he said. Because he went his way and most likely died and went to hell. So we have to do what he says. And there's several other, we won't take time to read there, but the ones that did what the Bible said or does what God said or does what our, their parents said or does what their Sunday school teacher or what their preacher said, if they just do what the Bible says, it's profitable. Anybody that went against what the Bible says is unprofitable. Some should have done what they, the Bible said and they would have went to heaven instead of going to hell. Some should have done what the Bible said and they would have been healed instead of died. Uh, things like that. So again, there were several that Jesus went up to fishermen like Peter, James, and John and said, hey, I want you to leave your boats. I want you to leave your income that you've had for years and years and years. I want you to leave your family. I want you to come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That probably didn't make a lot of sense. But they did it. And they went and they started being fishers of men. And of course, uh, obviously that's got, that got the, the church history started. And the last guy we'll mention, obviously if he hadn't done what he did, we wouldn't be here. But he also went up to a tax collector. And uh, Fishers of Men was found in Matthew 4, 19 anyway. He went up to a tax collector named Matthew and said, Hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to leave your money. I want you to leave this job. Uh, what's, what's been your uh, you know, go-to, what you've trusted in for all your life, I want you to spend your life serving me. Matthew 9.9. 9. And the Bible says he did. He went to a doctor named Luke and said, I want you to leave your practice of helping try to save lives. I want you to come help me try to save souls. Matthew 8.22. 
And he did. And the last one we'll talk about is Paul. This is a persecutor, persecutor of Christians. And what he told him was, hey, you've been spending your life serving the devil. I want you to leave that and come serve me and help me to fight against the devil. That's found in Acts 9.3. And, of course, Paul did, and uh, he started all those churches that started churches that started churches that started churches that started this church. And you can read that in the Trail of Blood. But in conclusion, if it doesn't make sense to us, we still should obey. Uh, again, if it's in the Word, and I, I, I would tell my, my kids this. All right, according to the Bible, you're supposed to obey me. If I'm wrong as the day is long. All right, now, if, obviously, if I'm going against the Bible, shoot somebody, rob something, do this, that would be wrong. But let's say I, I misinterpreted. And I said, this is how the Bible says you ought to live. And you obeyed me. And it wasn't what the Bible had said. I believe God would still bless you because you were obedient. Same thing if you had, and again, I, that's why the Bible is very clear about this in this realm right here. I shouldn't bring any false doctrine in this, in this church. Okay? And you need to know your Bible so in case I ever did, you could call me out on it. And please do. All right? Uh, and so that's why, but I believe this. If I did preach something wrong and you obeyed what I said, again, if not kill somebody, rob somebody, things like that, I believe God would bless you because you were being obedient. Now, that, again, that's why we should study this study so we can know how to rightly divide and things like this. I get it. But I believe God will bless. That's why he said his obedience is better than sacrifice. When he looks down, he sees, I'm being obedient to the word of God. Now, I hope the parent never leads the kid astray. I hope he follows the word of God. I hope a pastor never leads the congregation astray. I hope he follows the word of God. But we see here, God's going to bless our obedience. So even if it doesn't make sense, we ought to obey it. Even if it sounds foolish, dip seven times, why not five? My favorite number is five. Why can't I just do five? That's not what the preacher said. The preacher said dip seven times. Well, I'm scared of water. What if I just hold my nose and I go under once? You're going to die of leprosy. <laughs> he said seven. So even if it doesn't make sense, we ought to obey it. So nothing that we have or ever will have is worth more than us standing before the Lord and him being disappointed in us. That guy had a lot of stuff. And Jesus told him, go sell everything you got. Give out all the poor and you come follow me. I can't do that. Have you seen my garage? You seen all my toys? Kind of like that guy. Ah, I got these big old barns. I'm going to tear them down and build bigger ones because I want more stuff. Thou fool. <laughs> Tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. Uh, so again, nothing that we have or will ever have is more important than standing before God and him being disappointed in us. So if it doesn't make sense, we still ought to obey it. We saw three places in the Bible. Look at that serpent, and you'll live. Ah, that's dumb. Dip seven times, and you'll live. Ah, that's dumb. Sell everything you got, follow me. Mm, that's, too, that's too risky. No, what they should have done was done what he said. And so praise the Lord for the Bible, and we have everything that he wants us to hear that he said. Just do it, <laughs> and it'll be profitable, not unprofitable. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. Lord, thank you for your Bible. Uh, thank you for the principles in the Bible. And Lord, I think all of us in here are spiritually intelligent enough to know that if you say it in the Bible, we're supposed to do it. And you'll bless us for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.